Hey everybody, welcome back to the Verdigree Table. Today we are helping new Dungeon Masters and experienced Dungeon Masters dive into the Lost Minds of Phandelver from the starter set, and we're talking about part three, the Spider's Web. The game shifts a bit here and becomes more of what we call a sandbox. So far, the next thing the players were supposed to do was pretty obvious, right? They always could have done something different, of course, and maybe your players did. Cool, interesting. But the goblins, right, and then the red brands came at the PCs to declare themselves the enemies and kind of gave the players an invitation to, hey, come clear out my hideout. But now there is nothing, you know, actively trying to kill the party. And they do have some leads here, but they are free to explore the world and see what kind of toys are in this sandbox. Don't be surprised if at least some of your players are a little uncertain how to proceed with their newfound freedom. I would tell them that the world is theirs to explore and help them to review their options, their leads, their hooks. I would go so far as to actually label the map with the quest locations they've obtained if they aren't already on there. You know, one of the main benefits of running official content, getting a store-bought module, is the incredible amount of resources online from this incredible community. Some of them are free, a lot of them are free, like, the, like this tutorial series. And these sweet maps I found by searching for literally one minute on Google. Here's this official one with the secret locations edited out. And here is this awesome hand-drawn number by Reddit user SpookyBird43. Having an NPC hand your players something awesome like this because of the relationship that they've built up with that character can be a huge incentive to get the PCs to keep being kind and helpful to non-player characters. Now, this is the start of a new chapter in the book, so it feels like it should be the beginning of a session, but it would be great for you, especially as the Dungeon Master, if this conversation about where are we going next happens at the end of a session for you know, real-world reasons and in-game reasons. You don't always get to decide where your sessions start and stop. You have an influence, but you don't have total control, so don't beat yourself up. You know, don't stress about it. But it is, it is great if we can wind down the end of that Red Brand arc with the players collecting their reward from Halia and or Sildar or whoever, you know, the quest givers were for this portion, the mayor, Darren Ettermath, whatever you decided. And in that, like, debrief moment, have that NPC ask what the party is going to do next. And ideally, this is going to let you know the first place, at least, that the party is heading for. And you can simply open up the next session there after prepping it. Alternatively, you know, you can let the party talk about it, you know, above the table, outside of the game, even like outside of game time and use Discord or text, well, however you guys communicate and see what they decide before the next session starts. Now, we might not get that luxury or consider this, the players might change their minds just before they sit down at the table. It happens more often than you would like. So we do want to be ready to run all of these locations in part three. And the good news is three of these locations are very simple. Agatha's Lair, the Old Owl Well, and Wyvern Tor are essentially little one-room dungeons. So they're not going to be hard to wrap your head around. See how these three are grouped together on the map as well? I don't think that's a mistake. And there is a decent chance that the party will chain these three together if they've been given all these plot hooks at least. There is a lot more to Thunder Tree, but we've had some practice, you know, we're getting good at this whole Dungeon Master thing now. We've got this. Plus, Thunder Tree is in the opposite direction and far away, so we won't have to focus as much on the other parts if it looks like the PCs are heading in that direction. We're going to break down each location, but first, your party has to get there. Overland, travel, wilderness exploration, random encounter tables. These are polarizing things, at least in 5th edition. Uh, Matt Colville, the granddaddy of D&D YouTube, made a video about how to make this part of the game interesting, revealing that he and a lot of people think that it isn't, and a lot of his advice kind of boiled down to skip it. And that is definitely an option, right? You can just narrate the days of travel and the nights of camping, 
uh, drop in a few poetic descriptive details and just boop, set your party down in front of the keyed location. I personally love this side of things though, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about how to make it more fun and engaging, and like random encounter tables are the backbone of my campaign for the last like almost a year. So I've got a few things in the work, but today we're going to keep it simple here. I'm gonna give you one awesome tip to make your players care way more about these encounters that we're getting on page 27 from the book. Have the players roll the check. Now you should roll behind the screen occasionally as well to preserve your ability to force outcomes if you want to later, but most of the time have a player roll the d20 to see if an encounter takes place at all. If they hit that 17 or above, now have them roll that d12 also to see what kind of thing happens. Again, it is definitely smart to at least occasionally do it yourself so you can still reserve the right to force a call. Let's dive a little bit deeper into all this actually. There might come a time when you want to fudge these rolls, decide that they do or don't pull an encounter or that they get a specific one, right? Maybe everybody is bored or they're distracted looking at their phones and the table could just use some action, right? Or maybe you rolled wolves, but they already fought wolves and these hobgoblins here are way more interesting because they have a wanted poster with the party's faces, you know, crudely drawn on it. That's cool. Maybe an encounter here is the perfect way to finish the session or tee up the next one, or it would just really drag things out if they do pull an encounter here. So we kind of skip it to keep the pacing right. Maybe the player characters are actually limping away from some battle that they barely survived and a bad roll of the dice could just wipe them out entirely. There are reasons to put your thumb on the scales and it is okay to do so. A good dungeon master knows when to influence things and a good dungeon master knows to never let the players see them doing it. But letting the players make these rolls sometimes, most of the time, makes it way more of a game, right? And puts their fate in their own hands. So they're gonna be way more invested in what happens. Plus these encounters make the world feel more alive, more dynamic, more dangerous. And it makes arriving at the location an accomplishment, not a foregone conclusion. <laughs> yes, okay, I believe in making travel interesting with random encounters, impassioned tangent, over, uh, eventually we're going to arrive at our destination. Now, Agatha's lair is designed to be entirely a social encounter. She's a banshee, right? But you can't find the banshee stat block in the back of this book. That's because she would wreck your party in combat. Most of them would barely be able to even touch her and she can fly and she can just whoop, go through the wall. Plus one of her whales can wipe the party in a single action. Here's a lesson for new dungeon masters. The CR system is an imperfect beast. Now the book says she's gonna answer a single question. So the party has a choice to make. Do they wanna complete the quest goal, right? And ask Sister G's question or do they wanna pursue their own goals here? Now, do they get a bonus question if they are super nice or roll a nat 20 or something? That's up to you, you are the dungeon master. If they are, you know, really jerks to her or roll a nat one, does her face transform from an ephemeral, beautiful, if angry elf to something out of a horror movie as she pops that horrifying visage before she disappears? Again, your game, your call. The old owl well is potentially a social encounter as well. I would let the party get one round of combat in with these zombies before Human Kost comes out to see what the hell's going on. Now, I love theater of the mind as a change of pace and to get everybody to, you know, flex their imagination muscles a little bit harder, but there's probably going to be a lot of moving pieces in this fight and the player character's best move if they figure it out or not, is to actually kite these zombies. So I would use a map and tokens or minis or whatever for this one. This can be a tough fight if the party decides to keep fighting Human Coast and his zombie horde. So if things are going south for the party, I would have Coast stop again and you know offer a truce. In a fight, he is using that same stat block as glass staff, but he doesn't have the glass staff of defense. Those, those things that you prepared that maybe didn't get used can come back 
later. Yes, Glassstaff is also coming back later if he if he got away, right? No assumptions about what happened in your campaign. But he's also here at this tower, you know, reskinned. This is important to keep in mind because there is a good chance that, like, in your DM career, you're going to prepare to run a lot of places. You're going to prepare to run all of these places in Part 3, and then your party might not go to all of them, probably won't go to all of them. And it is easy to feel like you're wasting effort. But one, that prep work just helped you build your Dungeon Master muscles anyway, right? And two, you can always use that stuff elsewhere. Move things around, you know, change their descriptions and just set them boop, right in front of the party. If they don't go to Wyvern Tor next to clear these orcs out at the behest of Human Coast or the Town Master or whoever, you know, maybe that encounter comes to them later as they're traveling through the wilderness. Another thing we can learn from Wyvern Tour is how to make a pretty cut and dry, clear out the baddies mission a little more interesting, right? We have a single sentry to start, so the players can go tactical infiltration mode, right? Or be reminded that the D&D monsters are smart enough, a lot of them, to run back and alert their allies if there's trouble. And then we get a whole group of monsters, and mixed group, not just orcs, right? But a clear orc boss and his ogre enforcer. Kill the boss and the other orcs scatter. This is another place where it might be a good idea to have a map ready, just in case they do go the sneak around infiltration route. It doesn't have to be fancy. A couple rooms, maybe. And again, a quick Google image search is going to provide you with plenty of options here. If you find that you and your players are enjoying this open world sandbox feel in this section, you're going to love what I have in store when this walkthrough is complete. So make sure you subscribe and check back for that content because I am really excited about it. All right, so Thunder Tree is the biggest toy in this sandbox. There's more going on here and the adventure places more signs pointed this way. And it may just be that the designers set out to balance the poles to the east with the poles to the west, but I think there's more going on here than just that. There's a dragon here in Thunder Tree and that is awesome and also terrifying as dragons should be. It's the cover of the box, it's the cover of the book, it's freaking iconic. It's also likely to kill all of the characters and overshadow the rest of the story. Even at level 5, this young green dragon named Venom Fane by himself could be a hard encounter. They only get to have him down to half health for him to run away, but still at level 3, or maybe even 4, a single breath weapon attack here can end your campaign in this tower. Even if they win, the other problem with Venom Fang is that he's way cooler and more powerful than the Black Spider, the big bad evil guy we've been trying to make interesting. Now, in part, that's because the Black Spider is a little weak sauce, and don't worry, I'm gonna help you when we get there to make him more interesting, but this dragon, any dragon, is always gonna be cooler. There's also just a lot going on in Thunder Tree. It has its own ecosystem, right? You got blights and ash zombies from the aftermath of a magical volcano eruption, plus you have the uh, giant spiders getting cleared out by Venom Fang, and then there's cultists trying to talk to him, which is a tie-in to an another, you know, official campaign, The Rise of Tiamat, and we are getting to a point, you know, halfway through this adventure where it's probably a good time to at least, like, start considering what comes after, right? Maybe we finish this campaign when we finish this adventure, but maybe we go on to other things. And that's an option for sure. So, okay, let's check one point in the uh, include Thunder Tree in this adventure column. But let's, let's save the what comes next for a later video. Thunder Tree contains a lot of stuff to put into your brain, right, and into your player's brain that has absolutely nothing to do with the central story we're trying to keep everybody focused on. Also, counting hexes on the map, the party is going to spend around a week in game time coming and going from here, and that's on top of however long it has been since Gundren got captured in your game. If we cut this location, we can take right off and Myrna's necklace if that's in play, and the other loot that's here and just sprinkle it around our other locations. That's okay, that's a thing we can do. If you do want to run Thunder Tree because you want a dragon in your campaign, all right, cool, and good for you. I mean, I, I feel you. Um, definitely have right off the druid stress that Venom Thing is bad news and can TPK the party, total party kill, and then set the players loose. As written, Rhydoth is one of the keys that fits the lock of how do we find Kragma Castle. 
But as written, he's also willing to take the party straight to Wave Echo Cave if they chase off Venom Fang. Even if you do want the party facing off against this dragon, cool. Skipping over Kragma and having like a bunch of people know where Wave Echo Cave is, it's a big choice to make. I don't know that I would put that on the table in my game. But, you know, maybe you don't want to run more goblins. This is your game. This is your world. Do your thing. If you do go that way, I would consider moving Gundren to Wave Echo Cave so that storyline is still in play. Now, I'm not going to go over each location here. Have the stat block for the Ash Zombies and the Twig Blights handy. And for a lot of this, you can actually just kind of rely on the box text, on the descriptions given for at least a lot of the buildings here. Some key points... Rideoff is at 4 in the most obviously maintained building. The spiders are in 6 for a little dash of variety, but feel free to plug them into a different location if the players are about to get their third or fourth helping of ash zombies. 9 is the herbalist shop where we find Myrna's necklace. 13 is tucked away in the corner here, and that's where the dragon cultists are. Now these guys honestly don't have a ton to offer the party beyond betrayal. They don't have a lot of useful information, and they probably aren't going to put up much of a challenging fight. They do have a potion of flight and 300 golden diamonds that they plan to give the dragon, which, sure, could be useful to the party in some ways. And there is a lot of opportunity here to make these cultists more interesting in the hands of a creative dungeon master. But the, the way things are laid out, we might end up encountering the dragon before we encounter the cultists anyway. The star of the show is our boy Venom Fang at location 7. I've said before that you can pull punches sometimes as a dungeon master, especially if you have new players, but I hereby revoke your permission to do so while running a dragon. This thing is evil and cunning and powerful. The only reason it's not eating the player characters right away is because it thinks that they could be more useful, alive, adding to his new horde. Plus, it's going to be fun for him to mess with them. Now, the tower that we're in is 40 feet tall and half the roof is missing and the dragon can fly 60 feet per round. We are talking about a 3D fight here. If combat happens and Venom Fang takes any damage whatsoever, it probably is going to take wing. It catches many PCs as it can in that 30 foot cone of its breath weapon, right? Which covers most of this tower if you do it from the sky. And then he's going to go up on the roof, enjoy the advantage of full cover, and maybe taunt the player characters while he waits for that breath weapon to recharge. Maybe he would let the player characters live if they leave all their gold and their magic items behind, right? To make this remotely fair, have right off stress that they should not go in there <laughs> and leave it to the players to initiate combat. Keep it a negotiation at first. You know, don't throw that first punch. But after that, it's on. You can be kind and root for the players, remind them that they can ready an action as they wait for the dragon to show itself, but that might burn spell slots because it might not pop out every round. Um, and, okay, I might have the first round of combat with him be the claw claw bite on that PC that started the fight and then lift off the floor, but maybe stay inside the tower. But please, for your sake and your players' sakes and my sake, um, keep dragons mythical and scary in your world by playing Venom Fang well. The players could win this fight, definitely, and in which case, good, awesome, great for them. They get a lot of experience points and they get a lot of treasure for their efforts. And again, I'm not sure I would give them that fast pass around Kragmo Castle as well, but you do you. Now, unless the party got very lucky, Venom Fang flew off, right? Which means he could show up again later, maybe even stronger. So keep that dragon in your folder or whatever. Keep him in your pocket for a rainy day. Recurring villains are not easy to come by. Personally, I would even think about putting him on the random encounter table. Now, if we do have a TPK on our hands, we're going to have some tough decisions to make. A TPK can happen whenever. A PC death can happen whenever. But this one's going to feel extra bad because it's basically been like a little side shoot that didn't really have much or anything to do with the story we were trying to live inside. And it's been a huge spike in difficulty. So we have a few options here. And feel free to even open it up to the table after the players have had, you know, a moment to mourn their characters because, well, it depends on your table, but we can roll up new characters, right? Start at level three, point them at Kragma Castle, 
and the rest of this adventure. We can absolutely do that. We can even take some of the important non-player characters, right, that we took all this time to emphasize. So it feels like our story has some more continuity. Sildar, Sister G, Rydoth, Darren Edermath, Helia, statting them out would make a very solid party. Or, okay, hey, all of your player characters had younger siblings, and here they come at level three, right? You can combine any of these, all of these, and just hand wave any inconsistencies, and I promise you will be rocking and rolling again in no time. You could also alternatively follow these characters into the afterlife and have them fight their way through the nine hells of the abyss or whatever. It's definitely cool, but it's going to require a lot of work, especially for a new dungeon master. But this is Dungeons and Dragons. That's that's an option. The easiest thing to do, and my absolute least favorite option here, is that you can have the player characters wake up in Rydoth's care, having been nursed back to health by the druid. Um, it feels bad to me, man, because it, re it removes the consequences of your player's choices and their actions. Now, if they are children, right, or something, they can't handle it, okay, I can see it. But even so, I would rather let them make new characters. Death is a part of D&D, and at low levels, it's usually permanent, and that makes this special and different than a game with save points and extra lives. If you hit undo here, you're never going to get the tension and that immersion factor back. All right, enough heavy stuff. Let's have some fun at Cragmaw Castle. This place is about the same size as the Red Brand's hideout, so it should take you roughly the same amount of time to play through. You are a pro at prepping dungeons now, so you are going to read up on who and what are in each room and make a note of the important names and features and get your stat block handy, and you're gonna be ready to roll. You're gonna have the book with you when you run, so we don't need to memorize every little detail, right? But the more command we have on what's going on in here, the better. The players are going to get a chance to show these goblins how much they've learned in the last couple levels, but there's definitely still some challenges in here. This is the first time they're meeting hobgoblins, so stress how different they are. Maybe check out the 5-Minute Monster video on them for some tips on running them. Observe the increasing complexity as we now have three ways into this place. One is locked and one is hidden, so doing some recon here would be rewarded. The most likely outcome is the players are going through the front door, and if they aren't careful, they might have a big battle on their hands. This is a lesson in itself. Intelligent creatures are going to respond if you launch a full frontal assault on their home. Getting spotted by the archers in the guard rooms labeled three not only gets four arrows around coming at anyone outside with pretty little ability to fight back until they at least get inside and around to the door, but it also gets the goblins in four and the militant hobgoblins in six running to join the fight. Inside the door, a big battle or this trap going off in room two gets everyone in the front, western half of this place on high alert. Things can escalate pretty quickly here, so to keep things flowing and fun, I would recommend considering using waves of enemies if things reach that point. Each round, add in another room's worth of denizens. I would go four, and then six, and then three, and then seven if you think the party can handle it. The acolytes in nine hide and wait, as does the grick in eight. I love a good grick. Stone camouflage plus a dark space so even player characters that have dark vision are looking around at disadvantage for a thing that gets advantage on its stealth check. That means this monstrosity is very likely to literally get the drop on the party. Give them the art, get descriptive with it. A singular weird monster is a great change of pace to just plop in the middle of the dungeon. Humanoids have pets. Weird, evil humanoids have weird, evil pets. I'd say we're getting a two-for-one lesson in eight, actually. A powerful, single-use magic item. This is one of my favorite kinds of loot to hand out, especially at lower levels. You can hand out scrolls, of course, but they have limitations on who can use them. I like something like this better, where anyone can activate it, and it still has value once the magic's gone. Now, room 11 and the halls south of it seem boring, but they are actually doing a lot of work for us. They are insulating the back half of this place so that the creatures in 12, 13, and 14 don't come running to join the great battle of Cragmaw Castle if it's going down. 
11 is also giving us a secret way to come in and out of this place and kind of subtly inviting the party to go take a rest before the final push here. A lot has been written about the value of empty rooms in dungeon design. When you start making your own, consider the value of creating these buffers and giving the party places to make camp. If the party walks into 12, first one of the hobgoblins is going to try to get to King Grohl in 14, but they're going to have to go through the player characters in that like antechamber first, so it feels pretty unlikely. If he does succeed though, we might have a real fight on our hands, as the bugbear king and his doppelganger friend here will likely get surprise and the ability to use those special moves on the first party members coming through the door. That barred door into 13 is kind of a test. I'd give a good perception check with uh, an ear press to it. Big beastly snores. Again, if this owl bear is going to flee, it needs room to run and it's pretty tight quarters in here. This thing is actually tougher than the quote unquote boss here, but it's also got better treasure hidden above it. I love a good high risk, high reward, optional room in my dungeons, especially when they announce themselves clearly like this does. If the players go into 14 first, the hobgoblins in 12 will come in behind them in a round or maybe two. And that will help this battle a little bit because as a mini boss, King Grohl is not gonna feel much different than the other bugbears we've already encountered. Like Clark, he's got a pet wolf, Though Grohl does have a doppelganger as well, but honestly the doppelganger strengths are really outside of combat. If they know trouble is coming, that first round might be a big one. And even so, player characters who are recently rested are going to be fine. Now, you know your players by this point. Are they going to engage with Grohl if he takes Gundren hostage? Or, you know, is it more interesting to get the surprise attack? Either way, the real drama in this room happens after the fight. This doppelganger shapeshifts from a drow, already kind of interesting, into this alien looking thing as it lays there dying. Hey players, these things exist. Never trust anyone again. Also, we find Gundren knocked out in the bathtub and he's gonna dump some lore for sure and get us rolling full speed ahead to Wave Echo Cave, the lost mine of Fandelver, and the conclusion of this adventure. One thing before we go there though, as written, the doppelganger on behalf of the Black Spider is here to take the map and kill Gundren to stop anyone else from learning the location of Wave Echo Cave. But it is unlikely that the players are gonna learn that. And when they find this map on him, they're gonna think that they've stopped the Black Spider from finding the lost mine. Yeah, sure, it does make sense that the Black Spider followed the brothers there already, but again, the players don't know that probably. Plus it stretches out the timeline a lot and kind of reduces a lot of the dramatic tension. I would change it a bit. The Black Spider took the map a couple days ago and Gundren is freaking out because that means they're gonna find the mine and his brothers. The doppelganger was here to kill Gundren because they confirmed the location of the mine and the player characters arrived just in time to save his life. The Black Spider only has a small head start this way, a couple days instead of like, what, a month. And the players don't falsely believe that they've spoiled his plans. For this little coda here, do you think your players want to fight more goblinoids or do they need more XP to hit level four? Cool. Throw this returning war band of hobgoblins at them. Otherwise, we're bringing Gundren back to Phandalin, gearing up, and heading out to Wave Echo Cave. If you have any questions, ask down in the comments. There's a bunch of useful links in the description. And if you're down there poking around, hitting like and subscribe helps me out a lot. Thank you so much for watching. Take care, be kind, and I'll see you next time in Wave Echo Cave.